Oh God, we're here in the midst of worship. A few minutes left for Holy Scripture. Speak to us. Don't let us be the same for what you say deep within us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Once upon a time there was a Jew. And when his eager parents gazed into that tiny little face. They named him the Lord Comforts. A rather appropriate name to give to a little Jewish boy born in exile. God comforts. And God surely knows that Jews, young and aged, then and today, have needed his comfort again and again and again. The massacre on Sabbath day, seven days ago, who could forget the whole nation is still remembering. At this very time when we were in worship a week ago on the Sabbath day, the massacre in the temple of life Tree of Life, Temple, that's it. That name is such an irony, by the way. Eleven worshipers go to their refuge in the Tree of Life, and it becomes a place of death. They're gone. Squirrel Hill, Pittsburgh. America. America. That tragedy is a painful reminder that the Jews as a people have suffered at the hands of dark and cruel hatred for millennia. Comfort? Are you kidding? How do you comfort a people who are maligned and murdered simply for their biological, spiritual heritage? Go figure. In fact, a Pastor Rodney crafted a letter we sent it to the leaders of that synagogue in St. Joseph in Benton Harbor. And just yesterday, I got a letter back from an attorney in St. Joseph. Dear Pastor Nelson, it was good to receive and read your thoughts in the letter sent earlier this week to Temple B'nai Shalom. You're absolutely right when you point out that an attack on one faith is an attack on all faiths. And he signs it. That we as Seventh-day Adventists, our fellow Sabbatarians with our Jewish friends and neighbors, has created a most unusual bond between two people groups. I mean, here we are, all of us, Adventist and Jew alike, knowing that the countercultural contradistinction that we have to live with in a society that values conformity to the majority, which in this case is worship on Sunday. Worship on Saturday? Who would possibly worship on the Bible Sabbath? Nobody does that anymore except the Jews and the Seventh-day Adventists. There is a bond that we must nurture as a faith community. And so I hope you'll be able to go a little later in the evening than we had thought. They've moved it back to 8 o'clock Monday evening. Let's be a part of that interfaith, worshiping together. Why not? By the rivers of Babylon, the psalm laments, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. He was born in Babylon as an exile. And for, for a Sabbatarian today, guess what? The truth is, Babylon will rise one more time for Sabbatarians. One more time. The bond will deepen. So this Jewish Sabbatarian stands in front of his king, his employer, 
As the story picks up, open your Bible, please, to the little book of Nehemiah. You've got to go back past the Psalms, going back to Genesis. A little past the Psalms, Nehemiah, you didn't, you didn't bring a Bible, grab the Pew Bible in front of you. It's page 330 in the Pew Bible. Nehemiah, chapter 2. Nehemiah. His name means the Lord Yahweh comforts. And oh my, is comfort the order of the day today here in chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, and in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine. The last line of chapter 1 says, I was cupbearer to the king. About the third highest position in the government. It's a, it's a sacred position. I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad? When you are not ill, this must be nothing but sadness of the heart. And I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? How could his heart not weep? He's never lived in that city in his life. But he was told from father to son to father to son to father to son that that city is his city. And it lies crumbled. Ninety years earlier, a little intrepid band led by Haggai, we were with Haggai last week, weren't we? They went to that city. They started to erect the temple, as the Jews call their worship places. But for some inexplicable reason, nobody has touched the walls, much to the delight of the enemies who live around them. Everybody knows that more than an army, more than a strong army, what a city needs are strong walls. You have to have the walls. Why wouldn't his arm break? Ah, verse 3 again. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, yo, what is it you want? Then... I prayed to the God of heaven. Shoo! Talking about split second. That's it. You know, I never realized this before. Till two months ago, one of the fathers of our students here at Andrews University gave me a book. He said, hey, listen, I wrote this book. It's on Nehemiah. It's on the leadership principles of Nehemiah. So he gave the book to me. Two months ago, I read the book. You know what? I never knew this. I never knew that, that prayer is such a big deal in the book of Nehemiah. It opens with Nehemiah praying. The book closes with Nehemiah praying, and in between, he's praying all the time. In fact, in chapter 1, you know what's happening in 1? He's fasting and praying. The entire chapter long, he's fasting and praying, which reminds me to remind you about your board of elders and Brian and Vicki Vonderpalski's decision to designate the first Tuesday of every month, beginning in three days, as a day of prayer and fasting in the Pioneer Memorial Church. <laughs> you can't believe this. But at the same time, the board of elders was making that decision. Unbeknown to her, the president of our university, Andrea Luxton, is thinking to herself, we need a day of fasting and prayer around here. Talking about the synchronicity of the Holy Spirit, boom. And so she just sent a letter out on Thursday to all faculty, all staff, and all the student body saying, starting this Tuesday for a year, the first Tuesdays will be days of prayer and fasting. Amen. The Board of Elders has sent out a memo to all the elders. Hey, guys, don't forget, it's this Tuesday. Wow. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. By the way, there are 406 verses in his little book. 46 of those verses are dealing with him praying. 11% of the history this leader recounts is about him praying. He was always praying. I'm quoting Gladwin Matthews now. This is the strongest characteristic of Nehemiah evident in the book that bears his name. In Artaxerxes, whose temper could be volatile, here's this sad-faced Jew telling him, why shouldn't I be weeping? And instinctively, apparently, when you fast and pray... The seriousness of your intent is taken by heaven, and heaven responds in the most appropriate way to your passion revealed in prayer. <sighs> Why would the king, the first words out of the king's mouth, so what do you want me to do about it? What do you need? I shot a bird at him, open mouth, and he starts speaking. Where is this? 
Let me read verse 4 again. Then the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and here it comes now, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let, me, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. The rest of the book is the supernatural answer to the day of fasting and prayer of a little Jew in a faraway kingdom called Medo-Persia at the time. And oh, by the way, not only, not only does Nehemiah receive permission to leave, he goes on to say, oh, king, but I, I also need money. I need soldiers. I need access to the royal forest for lumber. And, of course, your permission to leave your employee here for a while. Not only does Nehemiah get all he asked for, but the king says, guess what? You're the new governor of that province. And I'm going to send a cavalry of officers with you to protect you the whole time. Wow. God says, why don't you ask me? Why don't you ask me for help? He gets it. On the heels of a Tuesday, maybe. Maybe he was praying on a Tuesday. I don't know. Nehemiah arrives. Doesn't tell anybody what he's doing. In the middle of the night, gets a reconnoitering team together. And they begin to examine, inspect the collapsed walls. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Next morning, he summons the entire band of remnant exiles. And I want you to read this. Just turn the page to uh, this chapter 2. Drop down to verse 17. He gathers the group together. Then I said to them, verse 17, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that we will no longer be, be in disgrace. And then I also told them, verse 18, about the gracious hand of my God on me and, that what the, and, and what the king had said to me. And I love the way the people respond. They replied, let us start rebuilding. The new king, King James reads, let's rise up right now and do the work. And so they began this good work. That's that something? We're with you. Come on, come on. Let's go. But you know what? Pull off a renovation project like that, you're bound to get somebody ticked. Just somebody's going to be ticked. And they were. Watch this. The enemy. Verse 19. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, when they heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? And I answered them, verse 20, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. Can I hear an amen to that? The God of heaven in this renovation project will give us success. The God of heaven will give us success, and we, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, enemies, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. My, 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 the God of heaven. Yes, can do, because he can do. He'll give us success, all the success we need. And so here's what Nehemiah does. He, he, he institutes the buddy system, two by two by two by two by two. Okay, you're holding the sword, you're holding the shovel. Let's go. Start digging. Wow, because of the threat of the enemy to attack, one guy standing there with a sword just in case the other has a shovel. Half a, half a day goes by, they switch. Now I have the sword and you have the shovel. Night and day, and get this, in 52 days, they rebuilt the entire walls of Jerusalem. I mean, can you believe that? Wow. Well, just turn a few pages. You got to see this for yourself. This is chapter 6 now. Drop down to verse 15. Chapter 6, verse 15. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Unheard of. We're going to take 12 weeks. It's a little more than 52 days. But they were night and day. Oh, but keep reading. Verse 16. And when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid, and they lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Would you put those two lines on the screen, please? Can you believe that? Here's our takeaway from the book of Nehemiah. The God of heaven will give us success. And they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. God, you got to help us. We cannot do this alone. 
And last week, God, in response to that, through Haggai, you remember he said, hey, by the way, yo, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. In other words, don't you worry about resources. I have you covered. I'll make sure this renovate project is completed to my glory. And then today through Nehemiah, what does he say to us? Hey, I'm going to give you the success. You will do it with the help of God, which simply be, means don't worry about the resources. I have everything you need to finish this project for my house. You're not doing this for you. You're doing this for me. My. So seize the moment. That's what Nehemiah did. Prayer to heaven. We're going. And he went. And the rest is history. Wow. Now I realize, come on. I'm not reading your mind, but there are, there are some people here who are saying this. Yeah, Dwight. Cool. Two million dollars. Do you know what, boy? That is an awful lot of money. Jesus is coming soon. We should be spending the money to evangelize the world. To which I reply, amen and amen. I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Take a look at this little brochure. Did you see this brochure they gave it? This is the last time you get this at the door again. Take a look at this beautiful brochure. This is the architect's vision of the building committee's planning that will result in an extreme makeover for the house of God on the campus of Andrews University. Take a look at this brochure for a moment. It's okay. You can look at this in church. Just thumb through it. Maybe you've already thumbed through it. You know what this brochure is all about? This brochure is about Jesus coming soon and our mission to reach the world for him now. That's what this brochure is about. In fact, I'm going to give you right now, and then I'll sit down. I'm going to give you four reasons why I agree with you. Four reasons why Renovate Heart and House is all about reaching our world for Jesus. Reason number one, I'll put them on the screen for you. Reason number one, we need a dry home base from which to reach this world. Huh? I mean, you can't have a leaking roof on your home base. The only water we want to see spilling on people in our Pioneer Memorial Church is the water of our baptistry. That's it. Or maybe the baptism, the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's like water. Somebody came to Dwight L. Moody, the great American evangelist, and they said, Yo, Moody, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? And he said, Yep, but I leak. That's the only kind of leaking allowed around here. We're all agreed. Man, you, come on, this is a no-brainer. We have to fix this roof to go to the world. That's reason number one. Come on, give me number two, Dwight. Okay, reason number two. We need a dressed-up home base from which to reach the world. What are you talking about there? Let me explain. Pioneer, you didn't know this. Many of you don't know this. But Pioneer was raised up by God in the beginning to go to the world electronically. It was, the first, it was the first church around through radio going to the community every single week. And then, can you believe this? You're not going to believe this. We, of all congregations, get, we get chosen. ABC Television says, would you take our Christmas Eve service to the entire nation 24 years ago? And from this very place with the most majestic music that Andrews University is known to have, we went to the entire 50 states of America through ABC television, a new Noel. Some of you might be old enough to even remember that. And then four years later, 20 years ago, the denomination came and said, hey, Pioneer Memorial Church, would you mind taking the everlasting gospel of Jesus to the entire world, to 100 nations in 40 languages? Would you be willing to do it? And we said, well, we did this with ABC. I, maybe we, God could help us do this. And we said yes, and we did it. It's called, it was called Net 98. You go to, the, go to the North American website, and you'll see a story reporting on the 20th anniversary of the Pioneer Memorial Church in Net 98. And since that time, by the way, it's not over. Since that time, New Perceptions Telecast now has been going and now goes weekly from this sanctuary to the nation, to this continent, and to the entire world every single week. Amen. Every single week. That's what all... We got the greatest media volunteer team in the world. You know, we have 40 volunteers here. They're not getting paid to do any of this. They're just giving their time. Why? Because God called Pioneer to do it, and we believe it, and so we're obeying. That's all. Isn't that something? By the way, I didn't pull that off, and by the way, you didn't either. God pulled that off. 
God had a calling in his heart before Pioneer was ever built 60 years ago. He had a calling in his heart. That congregation is going to be my congregation to go to the world in live streaming, to go to the world in the web, to go to the world in television and satellite. And because it's his vision, what are we supposed to say? No, we're not going to go. I meet people all over this globe who tell me, hey, yo, my, pa, do you know what? Pioneer is my home church. I said, are you kidding me? You're living here. Yeah, I know, but different time zones. We go to Pioneer every single week. The organ, the whole world knows the organ. The musicians, why? Because it's the home church of our faith community. That's nothing great about you. Certainly nothing great about me. It's, great, it's a great God who says, I think you kids could do this with a little help. So, Dwight, why are you telling us, telling us all about this? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we have people coming to our house every single week, God's house, and it's really embarrassing to have a leaking roof and buckets behind. It's really embarrassing when the camera zooms in. Ah, oh, don't show that shag carpet that was never intended to be a shag carpet, but it's now a shag. Don't show that part. Don't show these beat-up pews that have been here for 60 years, hard wooden pews. Can't you do something? Can't you put padding on it? Yeah, we're going to. And what about this, house, this sound system? This is, a, this is a reverb chamber that just bounces around. It's one second too long. The, the audio engineers who we hired said, man, this is way too much. No wonder your people can't hear it. Boom, 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 boom. So we're going to put up panels. They go, they go up for music, they come down from talking. They go, oh, and they'll be quiet, by the way. <laughs> Not like the Howard. No, it's quiet. Put them up. All these blank spots here. Why? Because this is the world's, this is, the, this is their church out there. And we want God's church to look as beautiful as it humanly can for them and for God. Wow. So I totally agree with you. <laughs> this $2 million is all about reaching the world for Jesus soon coming. You got that absolutely right. Reason number three. Let's see. Reason number one was we need a dry home base. Reason number two is we need a dressed up home base. And now reason number three, we need a discipled home base through whom to reach the world. Listen, you need to know this. Pioneer's discipling strategy is now moving to the next level with special focus on our children. Listen. Do, do you look at the children's stories here in second service? Do you look at them? We have more children now with us than we've ever had in our history. What's going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. There are a lot of young moms and dads coming to this campus because the newest growing demographic at Andrews University, I'll just plain tell you, it's the graduate students. That's the demographic that's growing. And they're coming, young parents with their little kids. They want the best Sabbath schools they can find, and I'm telling you, the world over, you won't find more dedicated Sabbath school teachers and programs designed, crafted with skill to reach these tiny little minds for Jesus. we got a couple leaders now that have come on board, and they said, listen, we need to be doing something not just for the children but for their parents. Lawrence Byrne, Glennis Bradfield, the two superintendents for the entire Sabbath school, children's Sabbath schools. They said, listen, we, what we need is a family-targeted discipling ministry that will equip the youngest children and families among us with lifelong discipling gifts and skills. So Lawrence and Glynis are helping us move toward a vision, a full-orbed vision. We're changing the pastoral staff. I'll give you more information in a, in a few days, but we're rearranging the staff to reflect this shift in focus and I'm going to be introducing to you a new pastoral position to help pioneer children, Sabbath school leaders, and families in shaping young spiritual champions by the age of 12. That's what researchers tell us. That's the last time you're going to get an easy choice for Jesus. After that, you're fighting the whole way. We need to get them now. Moms and dads and boys and girls. <laughs> wow. So we need, a, we, 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 need, we need a discipled home base. That's the point. We need a disciple home base. Renovate's $2 million campaign is all about reaching this world for the soon coming Christ. That's the point. It's not, only what, it's not only the roof, it's what happens under the roof. Pastor Jose is in charge of a new series of articles that start next week entitled Under the Roof, What's Happening in Pioneer. You notice the, 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 the motto is renovate heart and house. 
You can get the house looking glorious, but if the heart isn't ready for a house that's been prepared, God says, I need the hearts. I need, I need your hearts. Discipleship. All right, put them on the screen. Re reason number one, we need a dry home base. Reason number two, we need a dressed up home base. Reason number three, we need a discipled home base. And reason number four, we need a dedicated home base. What are you talking about? I'm going to be really honest with you now. When I found out what this building committee was tallying up, I could not believe my ears. A million dollars to replace a roof? Yeah, Dwight, there's no venting in it. That's why your shingles keep giving up 10 years at a time. That's wrong. And then another million dollars to do the extreme makeover in here so that at least it looks nice. It's a home that you're happy to invite people to come to. When I heard the bottom line, you know what I did? I went to God and I said, you must be kidding. You've got to be kidding me. Two million dollars. We're living on the cusp of a nation and a globe right now that are in tremendous flux and change, potential upheaval. Well, if there ever were an hour, we need to be getting out there, God. This is it. Two million in here. I cannot figure you out. I'm to be being honest with you. And you know what God said to me? In the dark, in my little study, at home, he said, Oi, yo, yeah, you got good ears. That's exactly what I'm calling for. I'm calling for your people to give $2 million out of their pockets for my house and my mission. Hey, Dwight, 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 come on, it's dark. But you know what you tape to the wall? You know that little verse that you tape to the wall, and I keep reminding you that's the mission of your life. This is what you're supposed to do. Think of what it says. Let me put the little mission on the, wall, on the wall of the screen right here. Luke chapter 1, verse 17. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's it. Dwight, how am I going to get through to your selfish heart? you got a selfish heart. Your wife's the unselfish one. How am I going to get through your, to your unselfish heart if I don't get you to reach into what you have begun to collect and take from it and return it to me? This isn't about repairing a roof. This is about repairing a heart. Your heart, boy. Your heart. And oh, by the way, everybody's nodding their head and saying, yeah, Dwight, you are a selfish one. We've noticed that before. Don't you just be nod nodding your head at me. You're just as selfish as I am. You know what? Somewhere I read that the Apostle Paul battled self until his last breath. That's the last frontier, folks. It's where the ultimate battle will be fought, selfishness. Don't you talk about repairing my house, Dwight, until you get your heart repaired. Ellen White, a century ago, on the screen, take a look at this. Constant self-denying benevolence is God's remedy for the cankering, cancerous sins of selfishness and covetousness. That's the only thing we can do. We're going to give it out of you. Read that last line. Continual giving starves covetousness to death. I need to break your heart, Dwight. I need you to let go. You don't need this security. Oh, you need some. I'm not asking you to give everything you have. I understand God says about equal, not equal giving but equal sacrifice. That's all I'm asking of you, Dwight. That doesn't mean everybody's gifts are the same amount. That's impossible. It's everybody's sacrifice is the same amount. You say, Dwight, how do, we, how do you define sacrifice? Sacrifice is what you have left over after you've given. The little widow had nothing left over, and Jesus says, guys, she was the biggest giver today because everybody had all kinds of stuff left over, and it was no big deal what they dropped with great fanfare into that offering container. Sacrifice means you have less left over, and you know it. And it may push and pinch, but you make it anyway. That's sacrifice. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Man, how many times have I... They, they sang that in Japan and Tokyo when I was baptized. That was the song they sang. All to Jesus I surrender. We sing it all the time. Yo, boy, 
You got any of those Skittles left? I'd sure like some. Oh, no, I don't have much left. Sorry. I got to work on your heart, Dwight. That's the point. Four reasons. Because he needs a dedicated people. There's somebody who's going to have to go to this earth, and it'll be you, and it'll be me. That's why Jesus came, by the way, to renovate the heart so that we could renovate the house. Calvary. What is Calvary? And can it be? Ah, oh, that was a song to sing today that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Wow, he could have picked one. And can it be amazing love? You know, I was sitting here watching the camera pan that little choir, the silhouettes as they were singing. I tell you, tears just sprang into my eyes. I saw that camera pulling on these young faces, and I said to myself, God, I pray you will save every boy and girl and teen on that screen. Amen. Don't lose one of them. That's what this church is for. Don't lose one of them. John 3, 16. Let's repeat it out loud together. Come on, the little girl. She, she nailed it. It's on the screen for us? Yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him. Boy, Lord, I can't believe you'll let us do this. All to him I freely give. God will bless you to the max for your unselfishness with him. He will bless you. Trust me, he will take care of you. Thank you in advance for this little pledge card. Where is it? It's a bag of my Bible. Here it is. Thank you for this little pledge card that a bunch of you have come today because we talked about this last week and you're ready to put this in the offering plate today. God bless you. Pull it out. Some of you said, Dwight, I wasn't even here last Sabbath, so I'm just kind of catching up on all this. That's okay. Pull out. It's in the, it's in the worship bulletin. Just pull it out. It's a little pledge card. It's simple. In fact, we'll put it on the screen. We'll put it on the screen. By the grace of God, I, we, want to participate in making a sacrificial offering to Pioneer's Renovate Heart and House campaign. And by the way, the key words on that pledge statement are the first five words, by the grace of God. This is not a vow. Somebody emailed me and said, hey, Dwight, I don't believe in vows. This is not a vow. This is a covenant. This is, look, God... If you keep blessing me the way you're blessing me right now, there is no problem. I will be able to be generous with you. That's what it's saying. If you should be in a terrible car accident and, and, and your income is gone, do you think he's going to say, well, I'm holding you. Look at you. Put it down here. This is not a vow. This is a pledge. By the grace of God, I'll do my best. And here's the amount I want to put down. And you write that amount down. And it's over three years. Did you notice that? It's over three years. So nobody's having to write a check tomorrow. By the grace of God. Equal giving, no, nope. equal sacrifice, but of course. Before I sit down, let me just remind you that we have the, the brand new, it just came out, the Adventist Giving Online app. If you'll download that from your uh, app store, that baby's on your phone. You go to it uh, and you'll click Pioneer because it, it'll know where you are and it'll give you Pioneers a choice. You click Pioneer and renovate is the third line down. If you want to do recurring giving, you say, Dwight, I don't have much, but I can give $10 a month. If you gave $10 a month, that would be 480 that would be, no, no, uh, $10 a month would be, I meant $10 a week, sorry. <laughs> I did not major in math. If you give $10 a week, that's 40 a month, 480. In the end of three years, $1,440. Wow. How'd you do that? $10 recurring gift. You can sign up. You got a little debit card that your parents gave to you? It's, uh, there's, there's a website. Can you go to the website, please? Yeah, pmchurch.org, renovate. You just go to the website. You want to do it online? Okay, your laptop, there it is. Those of you who are live streaming right now, everything you need, including this brochure, is all there. You get it all. All right, let's uh, go to the website as of today. On the screen, please. There it is. We got a $2 million goal, and look at this. Cash on hand, 342111 plus last week, 
the, the last seven days, $206,616 have been pledged. I mean, I thought I'd get a loud amen to that. Because we were, a bunch of you stuck your card in last week and we're waiting for this week. But praise God, $206,616. Oh, the God of heaven will give us success. Just shut out that naysayer named the enemy who's saying, you don't want to do this, buddy. You don't want to do this. Let every, make them all think you're doing it. That was like Ananias and Sapphira. Make them all think you're doing it. No, do it for the glory of God. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. You want to use a tithe envelope, of course. You pull the tithe envelope now, you'll see at the bottom in red, renovate. I want to pray with you. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray. Enough talking. Let's just pray. Let's talk to God. Oh, Father, thank you for the example of Nehemiah. We want to be men and women of prayer. We want to believe just as Nehemiah declared, yes, can do, because he can do. God will give us success. We want to believe the words last week that all the silver and all the gold is yours, including what's in our pockets. Father, you have all the money you need, two million. This is nothing to you, but it's a big deal to us. So I humbly pray that you will take the pledges that are turned in today and that were turned in last week and that'll, that'll come along the way. Take the pledges, O oh God. We put our hands on them, as it were, and we, we give them to you. Seed money. Bless it for your glory so that not only your house gets repaired, our hearts get repaired, and that would be the greatest gift of all. In Jesus' name, let all the people say, Amen and Amen. We've been really blessed by the financial support that comes from our viewers. And we've made a conscious decision not to continually appeal to you for that support. The fact is, as everyone in the industry will tell you, we're needing to make constant upgrades to our technology. So if God has blessed you and you'd like to further the work of this ministry, we invite you to partner with us. Not a single penny of your donation will go to me. Every bit of your gift goes to the mission of blessing your community and our world. You can donate on our website, newperceptions.tv, or call the number, you know the number, 877-HIS-WILL. Again, that number is 877, the two words, His Will. And may the God who has blessed you continue to pour into your life the gifts of His joy and His hope. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right here again next time.